It's now my pleasure to introduce Shane Solomon, who's the chair of the Pricing Authority and therefore my boss, uh, so please um, welcome him. Uh, Shane has over 30 years of international and national healthcare experience. Um, he currently provides health strategy and advisory services um, and has a number of non-executive director roles uh, besides chairing uh, the IPA. Uh, prior to this, he was the founding managing director of Telstra Health, uh, an e-health business uh, that was established by Telstra. And prior to that, Shane was KPMG's partner in charge of healthcare in Australia. Um, Shane was the chief executive of the Hong Kong Hospital Authority, uh, managing over 57,000 public hospital staff. Uh, during his five-year tenure, at tenure uh, he implemented significant funding and service quality reforms, um, including Case Mix pay for performance model and the ongoing um, development of a comprehensive integrated e-health system. Uh, in Victoria, Shane was the Under Secretary of Health at the Department of Human Services, as it was then, uh, where he's responsible for managing the funding system, including, including Case Mix. Uh, so please uh, welcome Shane to the stage. Um, thanks very much, James, and welcome to ABF 19. Congratulations for finding your way here. And once you got into the convention centre, you thought you were here, right? But up the stairs, around the corner, around the corner again, in, in here. Um, I, uh, I thought that today, given the election is on Saturday, that I might spend most of the time talking about politics. OK, we need a lesson here. The I in IPA stands for independent. <laughs> um, no, actually, we're very much into costing in, uh, at, at IPA. And uh, this election's been a lot about costing. Um, so what we've done is actually developed a, um, a classification system for the parties and a uh, cost weight for each one of them. Um, <laughs> but we think in the, in the interest of independence, we might just leave that um, you know, in, in the top drawer of James's desk somewhere. So actually, I am interested in politics. And uh, um, uh, I don't know about you, but at school, um, everyone has their least favourite class. Mine was British history. I used to look at the watch, the clock on the wall, and just wish time could go faster and wonder how on earth I'm going to stay awake in that sort of early afternoon Tasmanian heat. And, uh, but there was one thing that, it, that fascinated me. It was the, um, the story of um, Gladstone and Disraeli, the idea of, um, of one um, party coming in, uh, introducing change, and then the other party coming in, creating stability. So that change in continuity, I think, is actually hardwired in us. Um, we're all a bit weird, really, because we like stability, but we like innovation. We like work, maybe. Um, we like going on holidays. Um, there's this sort of tension always between us. We want the world to be just, not disrupted, but we want it disrupted. Um, so today, I actually want to talk about change and continuity, believe it or not, um, and give the case for continuity. Um, in the world of ABF and um, world of um, funding and give the case for change. So briefly I want to talk about where we've got to on the National Health Reform Agreement given 10 years since the Health and Hospitals uh, Commission handed down its report and you'll hear from Christine Bennett later. Um, I, I want to sort of put the elephant in the room about activity. We'll talk about the elephant in the room about activity and value-based um, uh, funding or value-based care. And finally, just give you five funding models for the future to think about. You won't have to vote about them at the end, um, but you, you might want to think, um, uh, you might want to uh, um, consider a preference. So what was the National Health Reform Agreement all about anyway? Uh, just on the issue of change and continuity, um, I, I, don't th I think when someone said to me in 2011 when IPA was created it wouldn't last more than six months, I was, that's kind of like a challenge. Um, it has to last more than six months. Um, so we are around seven and a half years old now, and in that seven and a half years we've, so we're continuity, I think that class is continuity in this world. We've had five prime ministers, that's changed, okay? <laughs> so, so, how, so it's very easy to lose track of what the objectives of the National Health Reform Agreement actually were. So they're actually quite simple. Um, one is about increased efficiency. Can we bend the cost curve of, um, of um, hospital services in Australia? The second, and people forget this, was about increasing the Commonwealth contribution. And I've been around long enough to um, have seen the Commonwealth contribution fall, fall, fall over years. And uh, this was the idea of growth, 40% growth and 45% growth and 50% growth in the original agreement. So the policy intent was very definitely to increase the proportion of funding that the Commonwealth gives to our public hospital system. 
Finally, it was about transparency and fairness. The idea that, um, that um, a cataract operation shouldn't cost um, you know, differently in Tasmania versus Queensland. And uh, so I just want to reflect on, on very quickly on where we've got to in these three policy objectives. In terms of, um, of efficiency, yeah, we've definitely bent the cost curve. Um, and I don't, I don't mean by that IPA, I mean we. Um, that you know, combination of um, what IPA has done, IPA's leadership, and what states have done in introducing um, ABF, and I think it's it's um, created a a, a strong pressure um, to keep costs down. You might think that's a good or a bad thing. Personally, I think it's a good thing simply because it frees up resources to um, um, you know increase the number of patients that are treated, and we'll come back to that, and also to deal with other aspects of the economy and this comes to the social determinants of health. So yes, definitely the cost curve has been bent. These are very modest cost increases. If you want to look at another way, the percent per annum growth in cost per NWOW um, was four, six, seven percent um, and quickly has dropped down to the two or three percent, you know, for a fairly prolonged period of time. That is, that is an achievement. So what about the increased Commonwealth funding contribution? Um, and I doubt any of you have seen this, um, but when we started, the Commonwealth was contributing around 33 per cent the cost of public hospitals. It's now over 41 per cent. A very significant shift in a very short amount of time. Um, greater transparency. Uh, um, this is a screenshot from the, um, from the benchmarking portal that we uh, have been, de it's been developed by New South Wales Health for IPA, and this is New, New South Wales Health has its own version of it. I think this is fantastic. I don't think there's any value at all in creating a funding system with incentives um, to, to improve efficiency and costs if you can't see where you sit against everybody else. So I think the data element of, um, of what IPA has done is, is fantastic. Um, I would say that uh, um, I think this portal is too restricted in its access. Um, at the moment, the rules of the game are that the states determine who has access to this portal. Um, and uh, I genuinely think this, uh, it's time to open this up to become far more transparent. But at least the data is there, it's out there, and people can see where they stand. So that's the, that's the um, argument for continuity. Um, let's just keep doing this, let's keep it stable. You know, we're doing a pretty good job. Um, let's just keep refining it and get it, getting, and get it better. And there is an argument for that. You know, I, I don't want to suggest that, um, that, uh, it, that in a sarcastic way. There's genuinely an article for just betting down this, um, an ar argument for betting down this system. Recently, um, a few of us from the authority went on a little, um, um, what do you call it, quick soti um, tour of the US where D DRGs came from. We thought, um, we know there are problems with an activity driven funding system um, that, you know, of course, if you incentivize activity, you get activity. Um, you know, it's the rules of the game. Um, and we thought, well, maybe um, America, who talks about value-based care, Michael Porter's work, um, and lots of um, you know, claims in America that they're now moving from activity-based funding to value-based care. And particularly, we heard of Maryland. Well, Maryland is the, the home of Johns, Hop Johns Hopkins Hospital, and you know, is, is famous for innovation over the years. And we heard that it had dumped ABF and moved to a block funding model. And um, we thought, well, maybe they know something we don't know. Um, so we went there, and we went to the Centers for Medicare, Medicaid, to Maryland Health, um, Health Department, to the um, Health Services Cost Commission that sets the prices. And we asked, why? Why did you do this? And um, you know, th expecting some profound reason. Their response was, well, um, our costs have been growing at over 10% per annum. Um, our costs are 14% higher than any other state in the US um, and, uh, and we had to do something about it. So their solution was to give a flat 2% indexation on the existing amount of, of um, funding. Um, now I, I um, you know, so we quizzed them and said, but what do you do when a new service comes along or what happens when someone closes down a service and someone else opens it up? How do you work out where the, how the money transfer should work? And really, they had no idea. And uh, so I think we walked away kind of happy and kind of disappointed um, that um, they'd done this out of really practical necessity without a great alternative system. 
But I think with, with you know, I, I walked away also thinking, um, okay, so if you run an activity-based funding system unchecked, it has the seeds of its own destruction, and Maryland was a symbol of that. Um, that is not sustainable if, um, if we don't address the issue of, of activity. Um, so what's happened in Australia? Um, for the first four years of the agreement, um, activity grew at really a pretty high rate. Um, even though cost, was, cost growth was about 2%, activity growth in the 6-7% you know, range. Um, and I have to sort of acknowledge some of that's real and some of it wasn't real. Some of it was about counting, for sure. But the interesting thing in the last year and a half since the cap has been introduced in the agreement, the 6.5% cap, the level of, of activity growth has dropped significantly. These are very powerful incentives that we're talking about here. So um, if I was to ask each of you, is growth in activity good? I think I would get um, a sort of, uh, a, a, you know, like the political parties are split. You know, people that would say, no, no, we need to keep people out of hospital versus people that would say it's terrible that you know, people are waiting on waiting lists. And you know, I think we are a little bit um, black and white about it and we need to become somewhat more nu nuanced. So this is just a graph of um, what's happened with, you know, people might think that um, getting, uh, reducing elective surgery for waiting the times for cataract extraction, for total hip replacement, the knee replacement's a good thing. And the interesting thing about this graph is that despite the growth in activity, the six, seven percent growth in activity, um, waiting lists have not really gone down terribly much, with a little caveat that waiting lists have gone up since we've gone to the two percent growth. So there's something in it. Um, but this is a debate I think we as health policy people need to have. Um, the second um, interesting thing about activity when you start to look at where it's happening. I have, a, I have probably a cynical theory that, um, that um, a lot of hospital activity in the later parts of people's life don't add a lot of value. We intervene um, a lot. Um, and so we pulled out the data on, on not just the ageing population, but what's hap you know, what is the level of activity by age cohort. And you can see that you know, once, once you get to that sort of 70, 74 um, uh, age bracket, your hospital admission rates have been going up around 6% per annum. So it's a much higher growth in activity um, and intervention for the, those groups. And it really raises the question, and I'm, I guess, um, of whether that activity is adding value to people's lives. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't um, uh, hospitalise or operate on older people, but it is a question that we have to raise. Does it add value that justifies 6% plus um, growth in activity? So what is value in healthcare? I haven't got a clue. Um, the more I've thought about it, the answer was not in America. We were very disappointed. Um, um, but we have to answer this question. And so if you start to sort of unpack it, okay, so I'm going to say saving lives is great, isn't it? Um, well, mostly yes, um, but sometimes no. Um, so in itself, that's not a, that doesn't define um, value and what we should be spending money on. To improve the quality of life, yes, definitely. Um, and you know, I'm a big fan of a cataract surgery operation on a 60-year-old who's going to live for another 30 years and can live properly. Um, I don't know if I'm such a big fan on a million-dollar drug that uh, allows someone to walk an extra 100 metres. So this is again a value, um, value judgment. It's not just a, um, a straight um, um, uh, you know, statement, if it improves quality of life, it's a value of healthcare. Avoiding hospitalisation, um, that's got a pretty strong case. Um, I'm a big fan of that as well. Um, and uh, you know, the whole idea of prevention and so forth. Substitution, um, substituting for the, for the less expensive, less disruptive um, option, you know, like home palliative, palliative care versus hospital. What are, or is value defined by um, how strong the clinical evidence is of efficacy? Um, if something works, um, we, should, we should regard that as valuable. We should follow the randomised control trial route and just accept that evidence. Um, yes, that's probably true, but on its own it's not enough. You still have to answer questions about what's the value to the individual person, has it added something to their life? Just a, a couple of stats about prevention and substitution. Um, incentivising that, um, we can see that um, um, the RHW's work says there's a very significant opportunity for us to incentivise keeping people out of hospital, around 8%. So just to, to close um, 
uh, quickly. I just want to introduce to you, if you don't know these, you, 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 you probably do know them, but just five models that we could pursue. Um, I'm putting them out there to say this is what we should be debating and discussing. Um, I'll say up front, um, I don't think any of them are cooked and ready, um, nor do I think that um, any of them on their own um, solves all the problems. Um, so what I'm sort of pleading for is a pleading for is a, a more nuanced debate about if we want to go into different funding models, let's go into ones that work in, um, and solve specific problems. So five five models. First of all, we can just fund programs directly, and we do that. You know, we do that um, um, with hospital avoidance programs. Um, we just take money out of ABF, and it's almost like an antidote. Um, and um, you, you may or may not know, but in the National Healthcare Agreement, um, we have a very strong provision that we can determine at IPA that a hospital service is a hospital avoidance program. And there are hospital avoidance programs, significant numbers of hospital avoidance programs funded um, across Australia and the Commonwealth is contributing to those and we designate, designate those. There are also hospital in the home, home palliative, home chemotherapy, which can be activity funded and you can incentivise that. Um, or just say, no, we're going to take them out as a program and just say, we want this to happen. The second model, and you know, this is the one that people jump to um, most immediately, is the capitation model. And uh, of course, um, its value is that it incentivises the substitution of lower cost care um, for, uh, in place of higher cost care. The risk is of underservicing. The risk is you get nothing. Um, and, uh, and our biggest issue is our ability to predict resource use. Um, in other words, to set a capitation price. Victoria's done it um, by looking at past utilisation. But I think we've got a long way to go to be able to say, well, this is a normative capitation price for 100 days of care, 300 days of care, three years of care, um, and uh, we have a way to go. Personally, I think this model is best suited for people with chronic conditions where, that, that, um, where there's sort of a, an acute on chronic um, uh, episode and mental health particularly is, is most suitable. Adjusting for severity and risk is an incredibly difficult exercise here and a lot of work would need to be done. So that's model number two. Model number three is a little bit easier. Um, it's, a, it's more time limited and it's bundling. Um, so for example, we did this at IPA, the fantastic piece of work on bundling for um, normal childbirth. And we worked out um, a price for the inpatient stay, the antenatal and the postnatal um, care. Um, it was based on good clinical evidence um, and we were right, right to go. Um, the only problem was we didn't have the data from the Commonwealth um, medical benefit schedule for shared care. So if we'd have implemented this, we would have been double paying um, on the basis of a protocol that um, was partly funded by the Commonwealth MBS, partly funded um, through IPA. So there are issues with it. Um, but we think that, that there is potential here. The biggest challenge is to gain clinical agreement around what is um, a good quality bundle of care. Um, so even for a hip replacement, how long should a person stay in hospital and, how, um, and what sort of care should they get afterwards? Is it in a subacute facility? Is it at home? What is it? Um, that's the challenge. Um, that was an encouraging thing in the US. They've developed 48 packages of care. Um, in, and, uh, and interestingly, um, the most predictable resource use was in hip and knee replacements, and they've implemented um, that um, in a number of places across the states. The main issue, as I mentioned, is data linkage between the Commonwealth and states. And I don't think that's insurmountable. I just think it's a challenge um, that we have to confront. And, uh, and I would say we've, we've shown great success in Australia at, um, at actually cooperating on Commonwealth state um, issues. We have some fantastic infrastructure nationally and this could be another, another one of those. Fourth um, is the performance payments model. So a performance payments model is again what the US have done. You just set a whole, no whole um, number of in a sense reward payments for good care. It's always at the margin, it doesn't address the core incentives, but allows programs to be developed that respond to those incentives. So for example, in the US, there were mental health follow-up within seven days of discharge, there was a percent target around that, um, reduction in hospitalisation for diabetes complications. So you, 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 um, you put, attach money specifically to achieving that performance. 
Um, our very last um, place we visited in the US is Staten Island um, of New York. And uh, I think we all walked away energised by what was happening there. Um, they were really, truly fantastic. They'd taken data, they'd looked at um, who was being hospitalised and why, and they created programs specifically to address those problems. So just for example, believe it or not, um, they funded um, um, housing. Um, and you know, I said, well, why, don't, why doesn't the housing department do that? You know, because homelessness was a key predictor of repeat hospital use. And their response was, well, they don't. <laughs> OK, <laughs> that'll do. Um, so we can get sort of caught up on the who should be doing what. But I'm just saying that, that if you create those, um, those performance um, expectations and you leave people on the ground to work out how they can achieve that, then maybe that's, the, you know, maybe that's an answer here somewhere. Um, finally, and the one you'll hear a lot about is funding based on value to patients. And, um, and I think in terms of cooked um, um, you know, possibilities, this is the least cooked. Um, firstly, um, because we don't have a national measure of what patients think. Um, Secondly, that, um, that um, the patient's view of value is a critical part of value, but it's not the only part. Um, you know, I'm not in a position really to say, what would have happened to me if I hadn't have had that hospital intervention? You know, that's more, you know, more around what clinicians, protocols, research can tell us. So somehow the melding of, of what's important to a patient, and I do think that's really a critical factor here, with what a strong clinical, what strong clinical evidence needs to be sorted before you can move to a value-based funding system. Um, but I think we should do, do work on it anyway. So I just want to finish by saying there are five things that I think we should, we should think about um, doing to prepare ourselves, I guess, for a 21st century um, value-based um, funding model. Firstly, we should start talking about this stuff. Um, you know, we should throw these models around and say, well, what could work? Could it work in this situation, that situation? Let's not just be uh, myopic and think that, um, that you know, activity-based funding by itself is the solution to the world's problems. Let's talk about it in the nuanced and sophisticated way that doesn't assume that um, one size will fit all, that we might have to do something a little bit more sophisticated than, than, than um, just pick one. Secondly, um, we do fund hospital avoidance programs in IPA. Um, but they're ad hoc, they're funded as clinics, um, and the model of hospital avoidance programs that I know works the best is not a clinic-based model, it's a team-based model and it uses technologies. Um, so to go the step of um, doing something about what we're already funding, you know, systematising, getting the evidence base a lot clearer about what works and how, how you might um, set prices for hospital avoidance programs. Um, thirdly, I think there is potential more immediately for bundling where there is a clinical consensus about what's a, what's a, um, um, you know, a good um, um, pa um, um, pathway of care, if you think of it that way. Hips and knees are the most, most prospective. Maybe we should consider finding out what patients um, feel systematically and introduce PROMS across Australia, um, like the original case mix data, which was introduced in the 1980s and you know, it took 20 years to get used. Um, so think a little bit long term and say, well, maybe this is worth it. Maybe we should just invest in the future. And finally, to allow bundling to happen, the routine collection or identification of, um, of individual patients across Commonwealth and state programs through using the National Individual Health Identifier, I think is critical if we're to move to a more bundled approach and not trapped into our own um, funding restrictions. So I think there's five models to think about, five things we can do. Um, uh, I, uh, uh, I congratulate you all on what's been achieved. I think um, our continu the continuity is a, is a strong argument, um, but let's not have our head in the sand. Let's lift it up and see what else we might do. And I just in closing would like to also acknowledge the work that James and his team does. They do a fantastic job. Um, um, and um, uh, I, I don't, you know, maybe you could sell the predictive model on who's going to win the election. <laughs> okay, independent, all right, I got that. Um, and also thank John, Jim Birch, who's been the deputy of IPA for seven and a half years. And um, um, when IPA started in 2011, it was James and I, and uh, it was in November, and we had to produce the first um, price determination in June of the next year. So we did a lot of random 
probably stupid things in that time. And uh, thank goodness we're reviewing all of those decisions. Um, so I just want to acknowledge the, the contribution that Jim Birch has made to, um, to it and also finally to the authority members who put a hell of a lot of work in and um, are passionate about what we do. Um, so enjoy the rest of the conference and uh, hopefully in one, two, three, four years we'll be a little bit clearer on what value is. Thank you. So we've got uh, a few minutes for questions. Um, so if you'd like to ask a question, hands up, and uh, there are microphones roaming, and also on the app. So because John Gillespie put a question in, I'm going to read his out, um, reward for good behaviour. Um, rather than start with funding models, shouldn't we look at what is required to deliver optimal care, then think about what funding models could apply? One size fits all approach won't suit all health conditions, will it? Mm. Um, yeah, although well, that's what we do, I guess, isn't it? <laughs> um, we do a one-size-fits-all. Um, so yeah, I always think start with the evidence, start with the model of care, and funding is a tool. It's not an end in itself. So um, you know, the, the, that um, work towards building a consensus um, around um, you know what is effective care um, is really the challenge I think we have, and maybe we, we lack the structures and institutions in Australia to to provide IPA. Um, with that information. Okay. Uh, Shane, mm. uh, just a question about understanding the role of uh, private providers, private health insurance. Uh, it's a very big uh, part of the Australian, big part of the Australian system, and uh, we, I, we can't even answer questions like to what extent does the public system at the moment service the private, uh, privately insured population, because the data isn't there, and we're not doing the linkage, as far as I understand, between say membership data and the uh, public activity data? Mm. Um, you know, it is, it is a, you know, a source of tension. People in the room may or may not know that um, each year we do a private hospital costing study and we keep this thing alive um, and, uh, because once they die it's hard to revive them. Um, but it's not terribly well used and, um, and one of the main issues we have and, um, is that the private sector um, generally doesn't keep um, up to date with current DRG um, 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 classifications. So they use multiple classifications. So even doing anything like saying, is, the private, is it better for someone to go to the private hospital or public hospital or as a private patient in the public hospital? We can't answer that question unless you look at both sides of the equation. Um, I know it's a very sensitive issue, the, the issue of what adjustments we make for private patients in public hospitals. It's a complex issue. Um, at IPA we still believe that we we um, have got the price kind of right, um, but that's uh, overridden in a sense by the target uh, revenue incentives that are created at the state health department level. But I also, having worked in a, in a single system in Hong Kong, I really value our mixed system. I think we've got a fantastic system um, of public and private hospitals. And until you see some others that, like the US that over-service and and charge you crazy prices, and systems that are you know purely public and uh, and you know lack the responsiveness. I think you you don't appreciate what we have in Australia. So any other questions? Um, yes, sir. Is there some research on exactly what we do do best, so we don't go to a model that? Um, is not as good as the one we've had for, for all this time. What we do best in what sense? Um, well, just across the board, mm. treating patients, getting right down to that level. Mm. Wow, I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I guess I'm just thinking about yeah. if we go to another model, the value-based yeah. outcomes, how do we judge whether or not we're heading towards the right model mm. rather than just enhancing the one we've got? Do you mean in terms of public-private? Yes. Yeah. The, the, I mean, traditionally, private has, has been strong and surgical. I think the data is showing that the, that the movement of activity um, for surgical is going more towards private. And I'd kind of expect that, you know, yes. because it's a waiting time issue. Um, exactly. Um, you know, there are other more concerning ones where where it's being driven by cost 
alone. So, for example, in obstetrics, the move is from private to public, and I'm sure that's driven by higher out-of-pocket costs. Yes, um, that's what the obstetricians say. Yeah. But I think that's a, that's a really good question. And in, instead of, you know, I, th I think that's what I'm trying, trying to get across is that can we think a little bit more creatively here rather than just keeping on doing costing studies and setting an average? You know, is, is there, it's time for us after seven and a half years to look at, you know, doing some things a little bit differently and, um, and incentivising, you know, what is good practice. But defining good practice is where our issue is. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Sorry, this one. Okay. Chief, Chief Executive Officer of the Guidelines and Economist Network International. Look, I think your point's well taken. We need to be looking at what is effective care and the evidence relating to that. And you mentioned that you'd like to get some organisations perhaps providing such evidence to IPA. Could I frame it somewhat differently in terms of the combination of the medical and the economic evidence together, which is, of course, cost-effectiveness evidence? Isn't that really the key here, that we need to be looking at, at that sort of body of evidence around some of the key diseases for which you want to develop new models for. So in terms of, you know, crafting your question, I think it's important to talk about cost effectiveness rather than just clinical effectiveness. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think you're absolutely right. And, um, and, you know, our starting point is probably the hip knee type bundling thing, because I think we can start to answer those questions. Um, but it's just an interesting observation that, that we have for the medical benefit schedule in MSAC, you know, which does that, answers that question. I, Jane and the authority board does a lot of work to answer that question of cost benefit. Um, hospitals don't really do it. Yeah, around specific items, but there's mm. broader issues around other types of care. Yeah, sure. We have no institution that does that in Australia. That's a, and it's a very interesting, like um, Nice in the UK is a, you know, was well, well Jeannie does that sort of stuff yep. as part of our agenda. Okay, good. I want to look into that. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Any other questions? A couple, oh. more, a couple more on the app. Uh, so, uh, it's a question around IPA's hospital avoidance program. So, what programs do we fund and where can people find out more information around that? Yep, <laughs> James is smiling because that's the question I ask him too. <laughs> 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 um, uh, look, I think um, it, it, this is kind of, we actually seriously have asked this question and it's coming to the authority um, board, I think next meeting or the me meeting after, um, so that we can start to have that discussion. There was a workshop held and the authority um, board asked James and the team to, to go to the states and just find out, you know, what are you trying to do here? Um, you know, what are your sort of hospital avoidance programs? Um, and, and how can we think together about a funding model for them? Um, because, you know, at a simplistic level, what we just take them out of activity-based funding and block fund them. Well, you know, to me, that's kind of not a step forward. It's just a, you know, it's just a different way. Of, it's just another form of block funding. So about evidence, about effectiveness, all those things. Um, so um, everything we do at IPA is public um, and transparent. And that's a, a value that we hold dearly. Um, so when that material comes to the board, we'll find some way of getting it out to, to everybody um, just to describe what it is that we do, you know, and how much it is and what the programs are like. I think it's time to have that discussion. It's, it's within our control to do it, so we, we should. So thank you for the question, and um, James? <laughs> <laughs> I can see my work cut out for the next board meeting now. So thanks very much, Shane.